Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the house of our God this morning, whether you're here in the sanctuary or you're watching later this week online. Welcome uh, to this time of worship together. Um, does anybody know what Saturday is? That's right. It's Reformation Day. Saturday is Reformation Day. It is the day that we remember the uh, Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses to the uh, door at Castle Church in Wittenberg in Germany and began uh, what started to be a reformation of the church. Um, and as I think I did last year, I had intended to, um, uh, to bring some Reese's peanut butter cups and put them on the door so that you could take them, but I forgot them at home this morning. And so I, I don't have those. Maybe I'll have them next week uh, for you, uh, if you like, because I like to put, you know, put the 95 Reese's on the door so then you can take one as you go. Um, so maybe that'll happen next week, a little closer. But today is the last Sunday in October, and therefore it is Reformation Sunday. Uh, so we're uh, focusing a little bit on Reformation uh, this day and themes of the Reformation uh, this morning. Uh, the only other announcement that I have this morning is uh, just a reminder of the candle here is in uh, honor and memory of Mardell, um, who passed this week. Uh, her funeral will be, will be a funeral here at 11 o'clock Tuesday morning. Uh, there's going to be private burial before that, but a public service at 11 um, here in the sanctuary. Uh, and uh, Jim Hansen is going to do the, be here and deliver the message for that as well for my doll. Um, do any of you have any joys or concerns or announcements that you want to share with the congregation? Yeah.
welcome this morning. <laughs> he said before Sunday school, I've seen you on TV. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a baby girl. Uh, everybody knows Noah. And, uh, oh, they had a baby girl. Congratulations. Beta Lee and... Uh, What's her name? Beta Lee. And uh, she was... Seven, nine, and she's twenty, I think, and a half. Okay. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. So, first of all, Karen's birthday is today. Oh, is it? She failed to mention that in her own announcement about a birth. <laughs> Shall we sing for Karen? Okay. Happy birthday to you also. And you have another announcement. Okay. Um, we're going to have lunch for Mardell. We're doing things a little bit differently. So we have not been contacted for food. You have to be And we kind of are contacted people to help. Because we're trying to keep it limited in the kitchen. So um, we're not too much. Anything else this morning? Okay. Our sentences this morning come from Psalm 119. The psalmist says, How can young people keep their way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Do not let me stray from your commandments. I treasure your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the ordinances of your mouth. I delight in the way of your decrees as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord in the house of the God of Jacob. Lord our God, we gather before you this morning to worship you. We gather before you to, to join our voices, to join our hearts and our minds and our bodies as, as one family in worship of you. We gather to hear your word proclaimed, to offer our prayers and petitions, and to sing your praises. May your Holy Spirit move in us and among us and through us in this time of worship. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, may the peace of Christ be with you. I invite you to stand and to wave at other people this morning. Our song of praise this morning is number 151 in the Purple Hymnals, Faith of Our Fathers.
As we join our hearts this morning in a prayer of confession, I invite you to respond to the words, Lord, in your mercy, by saying, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Righteous and holy Lord, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength, nor have we loved our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, in your mercy. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you have led us into the light. We thank you for sending the Savior to call us from death to life. We confess that we were dead in sin before we heard his call, But when we heard him, like Lazarus, we arose. Lord, in your mercy. But Father, the grave clothes bind us still. Old habits we cannot throw off. Old customs that are so much a part of our lives that we are helpless to live the new life that Christ calls us to live. Lord, in your mercy. Give us strength, O Father. To break the bonds. Give us courage to live a new life in you. Give us faith to believe that with your help we cannot fail. Lord, in your mercy. All this we ask in the name of the Savior, who taught us to come to you and seek forgiveness and grace. Amen. Her words of assurance this morning are from the book of Matthew. And just then, some people were carrying a paralyzed man lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Then some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, perceiving their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Stand up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, Stand up, take your bed, and go to your home. And he stood up and went to his home. When the crowd saw it, they were filled with awe, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to human beings. Brothers and sisters, believe this good news and live in its peace. Amen. as we prepare to open God's word together this morning. Holy Spirit, open our eyes and our ears that we may see and hear. Open our hearts and our minds that we may know and understand that which you have to speak to us this morning. And then enable our hands and our feet and our mouths that we may go and do and proclaim all that you have spoken. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 21 through 30. Romans, chapter 3, uh, uh, verses 21 through 30. Will you please stand for the reading of the word? But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, 
since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous, and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one, and he will justify the circumcised on the ground of faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. As I said, this is Reformation Sunday, and we are looking at themes of the Reformation. Um, Last Reformation Sunday, um, we started a, uh, well, I guess what would be a long-running series on the themes of the Reformation, the uh, called the five solas. Um, And these are them, sola scriptura, scripture alone. Uh, Sola fide, faith alone. Sola gratis, grace alone. Sola Christus, Christ alone. And soli deo gloria, for the glory of God alone. These are the five solas of the Reformation. Uh, Sola being a Latin word that means alone. Or singular, like, you know, solo. Um... These are the great principles of the Reformation from the um, what would be the Roman Catholic Church of the uh, 16th century. Uh, and last year we looked at the first one, Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. And uh, this morning we are going to look at the second one on that list, Sola Fide, Faith Alone. Um, the uh, it's important to know, I think, what's the uh, one, of the most, one of the most common questions that you get as a pastor in the Reformed Church, um, the Reformed Church in America, uh, where my ordination is and where I have served in the past, is Reformed from what? Uh, which is a long conversation, typically, but the short version of that is uh, from the Roman Catholic Church of the 16th century. Um, and there's, there's more to it than that, but it's important, I think, when we're talking particularly about Reformation and the Reformation period, it's important to know from what we were Reformed, um, because all of us are products of the Reformation and the fruit of the Reformation. Uh, and so when we're talking about faith, when we're talking about justification and, and salvation, uh, in the 16th century, at the very least, the Roman Catholic Church, the philosophy on and theology of justification is that faith and good works yield justification. You have faith, you do good things, you say your prayers, you do your penance, all of those sorts of things, and then you get, you're justified because of that. You are declared sinless um, through your faith and the good works that you do. The Reformation theology on this shifts the order of them, and it's because it's important to get the order right. Um, The Reformation theology switched the order so to read that faith yields justification and good works. That we are justified through faith alone. Sola fide. The good works come as a result of justification, not as a cause. They're an effect, not a cause. That's the, the short version. And on the front cover of your bulletin this morning is Martin Luther, um, because he's the one that sort of uh, 
got the ball rolling here. There were other attempts at at reform theologically prior to Luther. I always say that Luther's big claim to fame and the reason that he succeeded is because he survived. Um, Because all the others that came before him uh, did not survive. Um, But Luther was hidden away. Uh, Luther's Luther's comment on the idea of the sola fide, of the faith alone, uh, in the Latin is articulus stantis et cadentis ecclesiae. Does everybody know what that means? (laughs) You didn't take Latin in school? I didn't either. (laughs) But I have the benefit of having things that tell me what uh, other things mean. Uh, Essentially, it means... That Luther's comment, Luther's thought, his philosophy behind the faith alone, which was, which was central to, to Luther's theology, is that, that faith alone is the doctrine by which stands or falls the church. Faith alone, Luther, Luther said, is the doctrine by which the church stands or falls. It was that important to him. It was that significant to him. The idea that we are justified by faith alone. See, Luther um, was a monk. He was a priest uh, in the Roman Catholic Church of the day, which was the only church of the day. He was, had devoted his life, his dad, one I think wanted him to be a lawyer, um, he went into um, the ministry instead, became a priest and then a monk. Uh, he was a dedicated uh, Christian, and he had an overwhelming sense of his own sinfulness. Um, more than most of us, probably. He was aware of his own sinfulness, and he was overwhelmed by it. He went to confession and, penan- and did penance regularly, um, like morning and then again in the evening, Uh, Probably once during the day, too. So concerned was he with his own sinfulness. That that he knew himself well enough to know that his sinfulness was was always creeping in. And he wanted to make sure that he was doing his making, making his confession and doing his penance so that he could be right with God. Because remember, the theology is that that faith and good works yields justification. He didn't feel that he was worthy enough for God. Despite the fact that he was a a priest and a monk um, whose whose whole life revolved around the ministry and worship of Jesus Christ, he didn't feel like he was worthy enough. So he was always going to confession and always uh, looking to do penance. And he was not only uh, a priest and a monk, he was also a teacher. He taught others about scripture and about theology. And it was in the process of teaching that Luther's great revelation about justification by faith alone came to him. He was preaching or he was teaching on uh, the book of Romans. And he came across the passage that I read to you this morning in his teaching. And he was transformed he was transformed because of this passage of scripture now one of the beautiful things about scripture which I know that you all know this but bears repeating is that that you can come to it when you're eight and get something from it and you can go to the same passage when you're 16 and get something different from it, something that you didn't see before. You can go to it when you're, when you're 30 or when you're 50 or when you're 70, that same passage, and find something new which God will speak to you through the scriptures at that time in your life, at that moment. And I'm sure that Luther was aware that this wasn't the first time he'd encountered Romans chapter 3. But this time, at this moment, at this place in his life, God spoke to him significantly. And it transformed him. And it transformed the church because of him. Luther 
made this discovery teaching this part of the book of Romans that talks about justification by faith and not by works, but now apart from law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed. Righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. And the, the discovery, discovery is a really interesting word, is a whole period of discovery, but we're actually discovering something that's actually already there and been there for quite some time. But it's new to him. NBC used to do on their must-see TV, you know, if, if, when they were running reruns, it was like, well, it's new to you. If you haven't seen it, it's new to you. Well, uh, this is new to Luther at this moment. And he discovers that Scripture teaches just that we are justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. That justification, salvation, isn't based on what we do. It's based on what Christ has done. All of humanity falls short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we are justified by faith, not by works prescribed by the law. Jews with the law, Gentiles without the law, are all saved by God, are all justified by God in the same manner, through the same faith. It has nothing to do with obedience to the law. It has everything to do with Christ's sacrifice on the cross that we are justified. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. In the passage which immediately follows this passage in Romans chapter 3, Paul tells the story of Abraham and talks about how Abraham was childless in his old age and at the age of 75, God came to him and said, you're going to have a son. And you're going to be blessed. You're going to have, I'm going to make a great nation come from you, and I'm going to give you land, and you will be a blessing to all the families of the earth. And you're going to have a son. And Abraham believed God. He had faith in God. And it was credited to him as righteousness, Paul says. Righteousness came because Abraham believed God. He trusted in God. This is before the law. There is no law at this point. Law doesn't come till Moses. And Paul's point is that Abraham was declared righteous. Abraham was justified. There's no law to fulfill. There's no law to obey. It's through his faith. He believed God. And God credited it to him as righteousness. There are no good works. There's nothing to do at all. Abraham believed. And so was justified. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. Paul's own story is... One that is significantly rooted in adherence to the law. Paul was a Pharisee. You guys know what a Pharisee is, right? They're the people that are always attacking Jesus, that are always trying to trick him and test him. Uh, Pharisees were uh, were not priests. They They were lay people who were exceptionally devoted to their adherence to the law. They were especially... Um, religiously minded. Paul was, he wasn't a priest, he was a tent maker. That was his job. Um, he built homes for a living. Sold homes. So I don't know if that technically that's real estate or construction, but it could be either, I suppose. When you're living in a tent, maybe it's both. That's his job. That's his profession. Yet he was uh, devoted to the worship of God and he was intensely um, Working to make sure that he was in absolute compliance with the law. That's what a a Pharisee is. That's who Paul was. He believed in justification through the observance of the law. And Paul, in the end, after he has literally seen the light, 
after he has met Jesus Christ, after he has been taught, after he has learned, says, says you know, that, that counts for nothing. It counts for nothing. I confess to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. All of the observance of the law that he did in his former days, when he was uh, before Christ was on the scene, before Jesus came out of the world, before the, the, his followers were making such a stink in the Jewish community, and, and before he began to persecute the church, he believed in, in strict adherence to the law, and he did it to the very best of his ability. But after he has come to know Jesus, He says, uh, none of that matters. None of that matters. Knowing Christ is all that matters. God justifies the one who has faith in Jesus, not the one who does good works. For we hold, Paul says, that a person is justified by faith apart from the works prescribed by the law. Brothers and sisters, There is a a nasty human inclination um, to want to to justify ourselves based on our um, based on our works. In short, you know, when we think about people, and when we think about um, well, when you meet a new person. This is probably particularly true of men, but when you meet a new person, the first question you typically ask them is what? Maybe, maybe you ask them their name first. And, and then you ask what? What do you do? What do you do? We define ourselves by our occupations, by what it is that we do. When we're talking about the relative goodness of a person, you know, we we want to know about the type of person. Well, is she a good person? Is he a good person? And what we mean by that is, do they do good things? We are a pragmatic and practical and performance-driven culture. This is especially true for us. Uh, as Americans who, who, who have a long history of practicality and pragmatism and, and wanting to, to, to do. We believe in doing. We believe in achieving through action. We have a long history of it. We ask the questions to, you know, well, sure, we used to be friends, but what have you done for me lately? Right? We want to know what you've done for us. Why should I let you in my circle? Why should I listen to what you have to say? What have you done for me? Our value is based on performance. Um, this comes, we, this is ingrained in us from the time we are infants and children. You do something wrong, your parents punish you. Right? We teach law from the get-go. You go to school, you get grades that are based on how you perform on a test or a quiz or on schoolwork. We learn to value ourselves. We learn to value each other based on performance, based on the works that we do. And the very idea of justification by faith apart from works is just nonsensical to us. We don't really understand how that works. Because everything in our lives is geared the other way. This is why we have such a hard time with grace. Because we, we just we find it difficult to comprehend. And we tend to give too much weight to our good works. Because we believe they will make us more acceptable. To God, And we give too much weight equally to our bad works because we believe they'll make us more unacceptable to God. We give too much weight to our works. On uh, Thursdays each week with uh, Kai and Caleb, we have a history discussion for the week. Uh, history is our 
core curriculum for our homeschool, and Thursdays is discussion day for history. And this week, one of the potential discussion topics um, was about uh, false religions. And one of the subjects in that was was a statement that um, the activity was to, to give some, you know, three statements, have the student choose one, and then do sort of a a debate kind of thing about it or, or present arguments or reasons for it. We didn't actually do the activity, but it was in the teacher's guide. Um, but one of the statements in that that was up for discussion was the, the statement essentially that, that false religions always make salvation or, or whatever it is that they call it um, dependent upon human activity. False religions always make salvation or whatever it is that they call it dependent upon human activity. It matters what we do. If you, if you're good, if you're good enough, you'll be reincarnated as something better than you were before. Or if you do the right things, you'll achieve total enlightenment. Or if you make the right sacrifices or say the right prayers, you'll find favor with God. Why do we do that? Ultimately, I think it's because of our sinful nature and that first and, and original sin, that I, the belief that I myself am a god and I determine my own fate. For me, that's, that's what drives us. And that's why we always, we always tend toward performance why we always tend towards work, why we always tend towards justification or salvation by the things that we do because we can achieve it if we work hard enough or if we do the right things. We'll find success, we'll find salvation, we'll find justification. We give too much weight to our good works, thinking that they will, they will make God favor us more. And we give too much weight to our bad works, and we dwell on them and say, oh, well, I'm not good enough. This was Luther's issue. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law, Paul says. And Luther discovered or rediscovered and so was transformed. And so the church was transformed, reformed, with the theology that we are justified by faith alone, on which Luther says the, the church stands or falls. Because either it's about what Jesus did, or it's not. Either Jesus' sacrifice on the cross justifies us before God, his death, or it doesn't. Or it's Jesus and. As if we could add something of value to Jesus' sacrifice that would change the outcome for us. Brothers and sisters, neither our good works nor our bad works have any bearing on our justification in God's eyes. It's not about what we do or what we don't do. It's about what Christ did. We are justified through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We are justified by grace as a gift. We are justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. We are justified by faith alone. Brothers and sisters, believe this good news and live in its peace. Amen. Will you join me once again this morning in prayer? Lord God, everlasting Father, 
teacher, protector, guide, lover of our souls. You have brought each of us in safety to this new day. Preserve us, we pray, with your mighty power that we may not fall into sin nor be overcome by guilt or adversity. In all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose for us. God who creates, sustains, and provides, we are grateful for your many blessings. We offer to you our prayers of thanksgiving. We thank you for the warmth of sunlight, for the wetness of rain and snow, and all that nourishes the earth. We thank you for the sustaining love of family and friends, for the presence and power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us on the cross so many years ago, and for the sacrifices that others today make for our benefit as well. We thank you for the opportunity for our generous giving and for the fellowship of faith we find in your church. We thank you, O Lord, for the abundance of grace and goodness that you have shown and continue to show to us. God who cares, heals, and saves, we claim your great love for this whole world. We offer to you now, silently or aloud, our prayers for ourselves, for others, and for the world around us. Lord, we entrust to your keeping all those people for whom we have prayed in the silence. And we lift before you, especially this morning, the Carlson family. We pray, Lord, that you would give, um, that you would give yourself to them. That you would be present for them in this time of loss. That you would overshadow them with your grace and your peace and your love. as they mourn. Lord, we pray that you would be a helper to all those for whom we have prayed. A peacemaker, a physician, and a comforter for those in need. Almighty and eternal God, so draw our own hearts to you, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills that we may be wholly yours, utterly dedicated to you. And then use us, we pray, as you will. And always for your glory, and for the welfare of your people. This we pray through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you would like to contribute to the mission and ministry of St. John's, please feel free to send your offering to the address on the screen. Thank you. Our profession of faith this morning, you can find on the back of your bulletin. Uh, It will also be on the screen. It is a selection from Martin Luther's commentary on this passage in the book of Romans. Um, On faith, let us say together what we believe. 
This is why faith alone makes someone just and fulfills the law. Faith brings the Holy Spirit through the merits of Christ. The Spirit, in turn, renders the heart glad and free, as the law demands. Then, good works proceed from faith itself. Faith is a work of God in us, which changes us and brings us to birth anew from God. What a living, creative, active, powerful thing is faith. It is impossible that faith ever stop doing good. Faith doesn't ask whether good works are to be done, but before it is asked, it has done them. It is always active. Faith is a living, unshakable confidence in God's grace. It is so certain that someone would die a thousand times for it. This kind of trust in and knowledge of God's grace makes a person joyful confident and happy with regard to God and all creatures. This is what the Holy Spirit does by faith. Through faith, a person will do good to everyone without coercion, willingly and happily. He will serve everyone, suffer everything for the love and praise of God who has shown him such grace. It is an impossible to separate works from faith as burning and shining from fire. Our sending song this morning is a song uh, written by Martin Luther. Uh, Mighty Fortress is Our God, number 20 in the Purple Hymnals. Brothers and sisters, as children of the Reformation, we, with Paul, um, we understand that there is justification by faith and faith alone, apart from works prescribed by the law. No amount of good works that we do will earn us justification. We are justified by our faith, and so we do the good works. It's a natural following. As the confession said, um, as Luther wrote, that, that faith is always active. The good works will come. They just are a result, the effect of faith and justification, not a cause for it. And this is extremely freeing and liberating for us as Christians, brothers and sisters. 
Because we tend to worry a lot about the things that we do. We are not defined by how we obey. We are not justified by how well we adhere to God's word. Because for all fall short. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we are continually doing that. That's one of the very, one of the very interesting things I didn't mention in this passage. That, that very famous verse, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In the, in the Greek, the sinned is a, is, a past, is a past tense. It's a completed action. But the fall short is present, which means it's a continual action. In the Greek, it understands falling short as something that is continually happening. It is as if it should say, for all have sinned and we continually fall short of the glory of God. And thanks be to God that our justification is not based on whether or not we can hit that mark. But it's based on our faith in Christ and our trust in God and his grace. To save us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.